When the pandemic hit, the government printed a lot of money. The total cost of government measures ranged from about 300 to 400 billion, which is about 5,000 to 6,000 pounds per person. Most of this extra money was spent on public services, such as the NHS, support for businesses and support for individuals. Some of the most expensive schemes include the furlough scheme and track and trace. And of course, we can't forget the £35 million spent on the test and trace app and Michelle Moan's £200 million useless PPE contract with equipment which wasn't medically usable, of which she stands to benefit from about £60 million of profit. But pandemic controversy aside, we need to follow and focus on the money the government printed. So we know up to £400 billion was printed, and as a result, we've seen record inflation for more than a year now, which the Bank of England has tried to control by raising interest rates, making mortgages unaffordable for many, has put millions at risk of needing to move homes as they jump from sub 2% mortgages to 6% plus. But not many people are asking, where has that money gone? £6,000 per person is a lot of money. Where is it? While all this happened, we saw a huge boom in the property market, which is only now starting to slow down with the whole race for space and people sat on more savings during the pandemic and even through all the high interest rates over the past two years, the market hasn't seen a collapse at all. Of course, we've seen a growth decrease from 10% year on year down to about flat or ever so slightly negative. But the small decreases we've seen recently are nothing compared to the huge gains. You have to look at property with a long-term view. If prices did drop 5 to 10% in the short term, when you look at pre-pandemic prices, houses are up over 20% since then. So if you bought as the pandemic hit after a small crash, you'd still be up 10% in capital growth since when you bought. Now, as interest rates get tougher, people are assessing what they can actually afford, potentially knocking off an extra £100,000 of affordability using a mortgage, just to get the same monthly repayments that you would have had at sub 2% rates. And with a new norm ahead of around somewhere around 4 to 5% interest rates, this got me thinking, if people are slowing down on their purchases or want discounts on overpriced asking prices and the cost of living crisis is affecting affordability, then why are house prices still going up? Why is there still enough demand in the market to push house prices up 1-2% to a year at the moment? There's a few interesting theories about this. Gary's Economics talks about this a lot, so I recommend having a full look over there for the full story. But an interesting theory is that the famous old quote that the rich get richer is true here. Think of that 400 billion from the government. I definitely don't have an extra £6,000 in my pocket. In fact, I have a lot less than that after all the taxes and the cost of living increases. And I don't think that many people do either. Unless, of course, you were furloughed for a very long time and saw a lot of the money, it's likely most people don't know where this money is. Now, Gary's theory is that the money is making its way through the economy and making its way to the rich who are buying more houses. If you focus on London and listen to what's happening there, we're seeing a trend of a lot of very expensive houses being bought, but bought without mortgages. So the everyday person isn't buying them. This includes doctors, lawyers, highly paid professionals on six figures. A lot of them still need mortgages to buy London housing. And that's just your normal middle class these days. But the theory is that the very rich, the levels of wealth which the everyday person can't comprehend, the kind of rich where all they do is have wealth invested in assets managed by a family office. These are the kind of people buying up the middle class properties. We also have a huge rental crisis, as the working class can't really afford good housing anymore. At the same time, the traditional middle class are having to buy what the working class used to live in. The impact starts to trickle down the class system. Think back to the 60s in London, it was pretty common for people to live in a nice terraced house in West London or an apartment and live a normal working class life. Now, you have your six figure earners saving up for years just to buy a simple one or two bed apartment in West London. Likewise in East London, that's where the working class used to be. Now you could go to Walthamstow and spend six, seven hundred thousand on a terraced house. Whilst the middle class now buy all the terraced housing all around London and pay somewhere between half a million to a million pounds for it, 
That leaves the rich to buy up all those semi-detached and detached larger properties that the middle class used to live in in the 60s. Building up a deposit is hard enough, but I've always been a huge fan of saving my money in a stocks and shares ISA, which is why I'd like to thank this week's video sponsor, Money Farm. Make the most of your investments with Money Farm's stocks and shares ISAs, general investment accounts, junior ISAs for your kids, or your own private pension. For me, I have always invested in a stocks and shares ISA since I could, and Money Farm allows you to invest invest up to £20,000 each year while enjoying tax-free returns. They can manage your ISA for you with a portfolio that's matched to your needs and goals, or you can take the reins and build your own. Investing in stocks can be confusing and daunting. Save time with Money Farmers ready-to-go portfolios with their portfolio management service, where a team of experts are responsible for managing a comprehensive investment strategy. Sit back knowing that your money is in good hands with Money Farms experts. I also invest into a SIP, otherwise known as a self-invested personal pension, because let's face it, the state pension is not enough to cover everything when you're retired, so saving for retirement is equally as important, and by investing into a SIP, you can enjoy up to 45% tax relief, a free pension drawdown, and expert guidance when you need it. Head to Money Farm now via the link below to start investing with ease and receive up to £750 cash back. Register by the 11th of April 2024 to be eligible. Now, back to the video. The issue with the middle class housing problem is how far can it actually go? In the past 70 years, we've seen the types of housing that the different classes live in change as people get knocked further and further and further down the chain. So at what point do we hit the end game? What even is the end game in property and real estate? If prices keep going up in the long run and wages don't keep up like they have now for many decades, then how far can it keep going to the point where not only can the working class not afford housing, but also the middle class can't afford housing? And even your six-figure earners also hit this same point because we're heading in that direction. The thought of this is quite worrying. We've never seen anything comparable in history so far that helps us understand what that moment would actually look like when we hit the tipping point. Most likely, it'll mean living in a world where you can only really rent your own home as the gap between the super rich and everybody else widens further. We're already seeing the start of that with the build to rent schemes owned by the big pension funds, like the very popular East Village where I used to live in London where huge towers are being built and none of them are being sold or even given away as affordable housing to buy. Similar projects are happening all across London, Manchester and other cities in the UK. And I think the realisation that the perception of somebody who is rich often means your bankers, your lawyers, your doctors are all part of that stereotype, but they are just part of the working class in comparison to the super wealthy. And there's a common belief that a weak economy and recession or cost of living crisis leads to falling house prices and stock prices being challenged. But historically speaking, looking at the data, including the period after the 2008 financial crisis, it's proven time and time again that weak economic conditions often coincide with a rise in house prices and stock prices as well. And the wealthy and those with money put their cash into assets which grow in value. In fact, when you think about the whole idea of the economy, the economy is only a thing for the working and middle classes. The economy is all about spending money, money flowing around and taxes on those purchases. Whereas the super wealthy that have tens of millions invested, because they aren't selling anything or they're not realizing any gains, there's no tax and they're not circulating that money around the economy. They are simply retaining it and holding on to it within their estate. So an economic downturn doesn't impact the super rich because technically speaking, their activity and wealth isn't really part of the economy or interest rates. So where do we go from here? A lot of the world's central government banks are forecasting that the worst of inflation is now over and a lot of the hangover from the pandemic spending is starting to settle. So as interest rates begin to be cut and everyday people start getting more and more back into the market, it means that there will be more demand for the low to normal end of the market and prices will continue to be driven up, hopefully at a slower rate than what we just saw as the lockdown ended in that post pandemic boom. We'll likely also see stocks increase as well, as the super wealthy can no longer get no risk high interest on their cash with the banks. Instead, interest rates decrease more and more, 
of that wealth will start to make its way back into the stock market as well as the housing market that will again likely return greater amounts than savings accounts when all the bank rates were high a few years ago. So ultimately what we can expect to see is increasing house prices to continue. I don't think there's going to be a huge crash and I've always said that over the past few years on the channel. I think there's going to be a small dip. We've seen that and then it's going to keep going at a more sustainable and considered amount. And likewise as the rich start to take their money out of these low risk cash accounts, they'll put it back into the stocks and the stock markets will also start to increase, which means at the same time, although the housing market is very tough and the cost of living crisis is very difficult, by putting even small amounts of money into a stocks and shares ISA, you could potentially start to see some of the benefits from investing in stocks as well. If you enjoyed this video, then watch this one here to look at whether you should buy a house now or wait until next year. Check it out here and I will see you in the next video.